Ladies and gentlemen, shalom and good morning. It is indeed my great pleasure to welcome you to the 41st Interpol European Regional Conference here in Tel Aviv. This is my third visit to Israel and my first for almost 20 years. I know some of you have not been to Israel before and from my conversations with you last night and this morning, we have all been fascinated by the fusion of Israel's rich history and modern developments. Those of you and who were fortunate enough to go to Jaffa ta Old Town last night would have appreciated the fact that it is a 4,500-year-old town and has a rich history, but also it's been modernized with uh, very good conservation projects. And we looked at some photos, and Tel Aviv was just sand dunes not too long ago. So on behalf of Interpol, I would like to express my appreciation towards our host, the Israeli police, for their warm hospitality and the opportunity to witness the merging of the past and present and the harmonious uh, living conditions and arrangements between all the various religions and races who are living in Israel. And of course, I would like to commend our Israeli colleagues for the excellent organization of this year's Interpol European Regional Conference. Now, we all know that these conferences are essential platforms to deliberate on region-specific crime and security concerns. Our European member countries, of course, will be sharing their experiences in fighting cybercrime, organized crime, and terrorism over the next few days. We know that learning from past experiences helps us to better anticipate and prepare for the future. This will guide us towards achieving Interpol priorities that are aligned to global trends and which address all our member countries' needs. We have achieved much success in addressing regional and global security and crime concerns. But I want to commend you in the European region for having demonstrated time and again your strong belief and commitment to Interpol's initiative. For example, European member countries contributed close to 89% of the 124,000 profiles in our DNA databases. You are also strong advocates of the establishment of the Interpol Child Sexual Exploitation Database. And today, I am proud to share with you that this database has facilitated the identification of more than 2,600 victims and the arrest of 1,500 child sexual predators worldwide. I would therefore like to acknowledge the European region's efforts in ensuring that Interpol member countries benefit from Interpol's tools and services. We also know that the expansion of the I-24-7 system within the Central Asian and also the enhancement of border security management in selected Southeast Asian countries are commendable testimonies of your ex efforts to share capabilities and enhance the capacity of other member countries. I'm confident that with your continued support, Interpol will remain the vital link between the European law enforcement community and the rest of the world. On the same note, I would like to offer my gratitude to the Interpol European Committee, so ably led by the Chairman, Mr. Borut Salan. This IEC plays a crucial role in enhancing cooperation and coordination between Interpol and other regional organizations in Europe. We will be electing two new candidates to the IEC over the next few days, and I encourage you to continue supporting the IEC in delivering invaluable work and commitment to Interpol. Now, exposure to European expertise and experiences helps ensure that the rest of us in the Interpol family keeps abreast of the latest trends and developments. This allows us to remain relevant and resilient in a dynamic environment. Our ability to address both known and unknown threats effectively serves to confirm our organization's position as the leader in securing global security 
and in shaping the security landscape. It is therefore crucial for us to constantly take stock of the evolving situation to better understand the challenges we all face. We know that today, many criminals, rather than take the risk of being arrested at the scene by the police or even bystanders or leaving behind evidence of their identity, have gotten smarter and figured out that they can make much more, much more money with significantly lower risk of being, let, of being discovered by turning from the traditional street crimes to transnational non-confrontational crime. A study from the London Metropolitan University found that today, 80% of crime committed online is connected to organized crimes operating across borders. Criminal gangs now find that transnational and cybercrime are far more rewarding and profitable than other riskier forms of making money. The impact of, of organized crime and terrorist acts is now no longer confined within a region or its immediate vicinity. We know that globalization and the development of the virtual world now offer new and fertile grounds for criminals to ply their illegal trade and commit crimes. As an example, just last month, 137 gang members from China and Taiwan were arrested by the Malaysian police, who incidentally are my close neighbors, in a raid on a syndicate that ran an online soccer and internet gambling ring. And it was reported that they had made profits of US $1.3 billion from all over the world. This syndicate operated from six luxury homes equipped with call centers, computers, and even training rooms in a guarded, gated community, which was also home to their former prime minister. Two days later, 83 people from another syndicate, again with members from China and Taiwan, were arrested in another part of Malaysia for another scam that netted even more billions of dollars. They cheated victims in China and Taiwan through online scams involving a range of modus operandi from impersonating the authorities to phony credit card and bank charges. In fact, they were on the verge of fleeing the country, having closed down their operational base, and some had even made it to the airport where they were fortunately detained in the nick of time. They had just been in Malaysia for eight months when they were arrested, and the scam apparently originated from Macau and had operated from other countries in the region. Indeed, the perpetrators from both syndicates were eventually deported because I found out later that the Malaysian police had problems with jurisdiction and many thousands of the victims were not able to come to their country to testify. I was perturbed by this course of action and asked the Malaysian Inspector General of Police for more details when I met him last Friday. Now, he told me something interesting. Though the two syndicates were unknown to each other, they were controlled by a common Taiwanese organized crime boss. This was why the second syndicate had been alerted to pack up. Fortunately, the Taiwanese police, which as we all know is not an Interpol member, was able to fully cooperate with its Chinese and Malaysian counterparts and had alerted them of what was happening from its own close monitoring. The Malaysian police chief was confident that despite the gang members being deported and not prosecuted in Malaysia, they would get their just dues when they were back in their homeland. I think this case illustrates how organized crime is now able to recruit members from countries without diplomatic ties to commit crimes overseas, operating from temporary safe bases in third countries equipped with the latest technology. It also shows that there are links between syndicates that operate scams and those which promote illegal betting and presumably match fixing using sophisticated modus operandi. In this case, exceptional international police cooperation within the region thwarted them. I'm sure that within the European region, you would have many similar success stories. But just ask yourself, would the result have been the same if these criminals 
chose to operate across regions or across continents. And what if, with the billions of dollars that they are profiting from, they invest in even more advanced technologies to perpetrate and conceal their crimes? How can we match them, even as many of our members are facing funding cuts and Interpol's annual budget is not more than one-tenth of a billion dollars? I will leave it to our indefatigable Secretary General to excite you with the many new initiatives that he has with great resourcefulness embarked upon to seek new funding sources. What I'll do tonight, uh, today is to instead focus on our need to cooperate and innovate. We are all too aware that terrorists and organized crime is, are, are quick to take advantage of sophisticated tools that exploit vulnerabilities to penetrate critical and security infrastructures to facilitate their nefarious activities. Here in Israel alone, a reported number of over 1,000 cyber attacks take place every minute. Ex experts have also estimated that the cost of cyber crime is larger than the combined cost of cocaine, marijuana, and heroin trafficking. In Europe, the cost of cyber crime has apparently reached 750 billion euros a year. Likewise, we have seen global financial institutions suffer from major cyber attacks on their networks and servers, with US banks purportedly losing only $900 million to bank robbers, but $12 billion to cyber criminals last year. As you may know, even Interpol was not spared when the anonymous group launched a distributed denial of services attack against our website in reaction to our arrests of their members. In the words of a former director of CIA, and I quote, we have built our future upon a capability that we have not learned how to protect. And I presume that he prefers to the internet. Now, as part of our mandate to create a safer world, there is a need for a collective effort to work with key stakeholders and optimize information exchange among our member countries. We also need to focus on developing innovative solutions in order to stay ahead of the criminals. We have done it successfully before, and I'm confident that we continue to do so. As an example, just three months ago, I received an original set of typewritten documents from a former police officer from Norway. And these documents showed that Interpol conducted its first computer crime seminar over 30 years ago, when most people were not even aware of the great impact that computers would have on their lives, let alone the devastating effects of cybercrime. A key initiative, and this is something which you will be updated on, is the Interpol Global Complex for Innovation in Singapore. When operational in about two years' time, the IGCI will be an excellent platform for Interpol to realize the full potential of public-private partnerships in developing cutting-edge solutions that are relevant to our needs. We'll also enhance our capability against cybercrime by drawing on the strengths of our member country and establish, establish security partnerships with the private sector and academia in the area of research and development. We have already received many offers of, uh, to second staff or collaborate in one way or another in a field of digital security and cybercrime from all around the world. These collaborative multidisciplinary efforts will see the foundation for Interpol's ability to remain both progressive and responsive to, to emergent threats. The IGCI also symbolizes Interpol's visionary and entrepreneurial spirit in ensuring the organization's future developments. We need to innovate and engage with new partners without compromising on governance. This empowers our organization to be better prepared to innovate and adapt to the ever-changing security landscape. With a multifaceted strategy involving the close cooperation of our member countries and stakeholders, I'm convinced that we will achieve greater success in preventing and fighting regional and global crimes. In closing, I would like to take this opportunity to invite all of you to the 81st Interpol General Assembly in Rome, Italy this coming November. A high-level ministerial meeting will be held on the first day of the General Assembly 
This meeting will focus on issues ranging from human trafficking to urban, youth and terrorist violence and the police's role in tackling them. Let us all encourage our ministers to participate in this very significant event, which I'm sure will be very well organised with great aplomb and style by our Italian colleagues. Interpol's successes and achievements would not have been possible without your robust support and belief in Interpol's mission to create a safer world. Let us forge stronger ties between the European region and the rest of our member countries. I'm confident that these member countries will appreciate the partnerships that will continue to flourish in the future and pave the way, pave the way towards achieving our noble mission. I wish you a productive and enriching conference over the next few days. Thank you and good day. Toda Rabah.